In this video we will take a look at the first total synthesis of resveratrol and two interesting resveratrol derivatives. During this work we learned some important lessons about our epoxide olefination reaction which gave us a better idea about its mechanism and thus allowed us to do some further optimization. But first things first. What is resveratrol? You will probably have heard about resveratrol. It and a couple of other hydroxystilbenes have risen to some prominence as ingredients of red wine to which several healthy benefits were attributed. And who doesn't like to hear that a daily glass of wine isn't a boozing habit but a valiant act protecting one's cardiovascular system? <laughs> well, unfortunately we have to pour some water into your wine here. These health benefits seem somewhat debatable. But we are not here to talk about resveratrol but resveratrol. Resveratrol can be generated from resveratrol by irradiating it with UV light. This results in a highly fluorescent molecule and the interesting thing about resveratrol is that there is some evidence that it allows for two photon absorption. Before we start talking about the synthesis let's have a quick and very basic recap of fluorescence in order to see why this is so interesting. Usually it takes absorption of a photon with quite a lot of energy to excite a fluorescent molecule. In order to revert to the ground state some energy is usually emitted as heat so the photon that is re-emitted has less energy and thus a higher wavelength than the photon which was absorbed. That's why we usually use UV lamps to excite fluorescent molecules. However, this is far from ideal for biological applications as many cells don't really like being smashed with UV light. Two photon absorption on the other hand proceeds via a virtual state which is kind of halfway between the ground state and the excited state. This means that a photon with less energy is required to reach this virtual state. But from it a second low energy photon is enough to reach the excited state from which fluorescence can occur. So a longer wavelength can be used to excite molecules that allow for two photon absorption which makes resveratrol an interesting candidate for a biological label. So how can we get our hands on it? Resveratrol was isolated and named by Kim and co-workers after irradiation of transresveratrol and isolation by preparative TLC. They also proposed a mechanism for this photochemical transformation. Since the relationship between resveratrol and resveratrone is not that obvious we color coded the relevant parts. Their mechanistic proposal relies on a cis-trans isomerization which is followed by a 6 pi electrocyclic ring closure that closes the naphthalene moiety. In order to break up the blue cyclohexadiene a second electrocyclic ring closure is proposed which builds up this blue by cyclohexanol. A tautomerization to the corresponding ketone generates a classic fragmentation precursor in which the carbonyl group acts as an electron sink and the vinologous enol acts as an electron donor. And the product of this fragmentation is only two tautomerizations away from resveratrol. So it is possible to make resveratrol from cheaply available resveratrol this way. However, the synthesis is quite cumbersome and involves large solvent volumes and extensive purification. Therefore, developing a total synthesis for this molecule seemed quite attractive. For this we envisioned a globally protected intermediate which could in turn be made from a naphthylboronic acid derivative and a known epoxide precursor by using our epoxide olefination reaction. This olefination, which was published by us in 2019, relies on the lithiation of an epoxide and subsequent formation of an aid complex with a boronate. The aid complex can then undergo a metazen type 1-2 rearrangement which delivers a beta alkoxy boronate which then undergoes some type of zyn elimination upon heating. The cute thing about this chemistry is that the resulting alkene could be turned back into an epoxide again so that it can be applied iteratively. However, there is a problem. In order to get good yields out of this reaction, two equivalents of the boronate precursor are usually necessary. 
The reason for this might very well be that the alkoxide that results from the 1,2 rearrangement reacts with another equivalent of the boronic ester. That means if the 1,2 rearrangement, which could also be catalyzed by excess boronate, is as fast or even faster than the 8 complex formation, one molecule of lithiated epoxide will take two molecules of boronic ester out of the equation. The second equivalent of boronic ester is re-liberated after the elimination, but for alkyl-substituted alkenes that requires heating. And since a lithiated epoxide is a classic carbonoid, it will certainly not survive such a harsh treatment. This was an interesting challenge for our proposed resveratrol synthesis, as the naphthalene building block would be about as precious as the epoxide. But there was some good news as well. The alkene we were about to make was conjugated to an aromatic system. And this should speed up the elimination step and thus re-liberate the boronic ester. We tried this out on a simple styrene derivative first. For this we were able to reduce the required excess of boronic acid ester to only 1.3 equivalents. Motivated by these results, we then set out to make the required pinnacle boronic ester by hartwig miara boilation. While the yield of this reaction was quite good, there was almost no regioselectivity, which unfortunately is quite typical for this type of substrate. However, separation by reversed phase MPLC gave us both regioisomers, and only one of those underwent partial decomposition in the methanol water eluent. This can be rationalized as the boronic ester in this position can activate a nucleophilic attack on the silyl group. Nevertheless, with both of these compounds in our hands, we followed Blonsky's procedure to the required epoxide precursor. And this one proceeds in very good yields. We then reacted it with the appropriate naphthol boronate derivative and voila, got the desired coupling product. While the yield was less satisfying than with the less electron-rich test system, we were nevertheless able to get our hands on resveratrone after global deprotection of this olefination product. Similar yields were also obtained for the regioisomer, which we called isoresveratrone here. However, since the boronic ester necessary for making resveratrone is somewhat unstable, it was quite easy to get our hands on the one necessary for making isoresveratrone. And since the UV spectra of both compounds look similar enough, we decided to apply our synthesis to an isoresveratrone derivative that can be used for click reactions and thus might be very useful as a label for biological applications. Starting from commercially available 4-bromobutyryl chloride, we prepared this propagyl ketone, which was then protected as an acetal and converted into this alkene by Lindler reduction. Substitution of the bromide and epoxidation with oxone delivered the necessary epoxide precursor. Since here the epoxide was somewhat more precious than the boronic ester, we felt justified to use a slightly greater excess of boronic ester for the epoxide olefination. And this led to a 51% yield based on the epoxide. This azide derivative might serve as an interesting label since it can now be connected to the alkyne of your choice. We just used phenylacetylene as a cheap model substrate here and we were quite surprised by the low yield obtained after chromatography. However, according to mass spec, this was due to partial desilylation of the phenyl ethers under the aqueous conditions. So using a different click protocol or avoiding chromatography after this step might be a good idea. However, global deprotection under acidic conditions worked very well and furnished the desired labeled product. So, if you want to learn more about this chemistry, check out our article available in Chemistry Open. Thanks to a special deal between Wiley at the University of Duisburg-Essen, the article is available free of charge. Talking about money, we would also like to thank the DFG for funding. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this research. If you want to read the article, you can find a direct link in the video description below.
if you'd rather like to watch another video, why not take a look at the video abstract of the original article in which we described the epoxide olefination for the first time and also talk about its iterative application for making dry or even tetra-substituted alkenes. You can find this video behind the left link. Or check out the video on the right, in which we take a more general look into transition metal-free olefination chemistry that employs boronic esters and similar elimination precursors as the one shown in here.